Islamic centers across the metro area have extra security for their prayer services tonight. Denver police arrested a man they say was inside of a mosque in the city with a weapon today. Police say that suspect ran out of the downtown Denver Islamic Center at 30th and Downing before their officers arrived. He was arrested nearby. They have not said what kind of weapon he had or whether he made any kind of specific threat against the mosque. Security has been increased at mosques across the area tonight. We are expecting a briefing from police in 15 minutes and we will bring it to you live when it happens. Actually just got an email from one of our reporters there on the scene at that downtown Denver Islamic Center who says that the imam of that center tells him that the man was waving what he believed to be some kind of automatic rifle. Again, that man is in custody. Denver police will have a briefing coming up in about 15 minutes. Mike Kaufman says that Mike Kaufman is the next mayor of Aurora. The former Republican congressman is declaring victory in that tight race, while the Democratic candidate Omar Montgomery is not conceding. So Kaufman's lead shrunk from 281 votes to 215 votes after some voters fixed signature issues with their ballots this week. Kaufman gave a victory speech today, saying that he sees progress for Aurora as being easier than when he was trying to make headway in Congress. A future focus on solving our transportation challenges, creating jobs, and reducing the crime rate to make Aurora one of the safest cities in America. As we so often hear in these tight races, the campaign that's behind says every vote must count. Well, maybe not every vote. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger joins us from Aurora City Hall. And Marshall, you have some insight into the wrangling that's been going on over the last week, this, this vote by vote process where the campaigns go door to door looking for additional votes. Yeah, both Mike Kaufman and Omar Montgomery want to be at the top of this dais to be the mayor. And to do so, over the last week, they've had to go door to door to help people fix the ballots that weren't counted. People who messed up a signature or forgot an ID. And today we saw a video of one encounter of what that looks like when someone shows up unexpectedly at your door. I'm honored to receive a vote of confidence by one of the most diverse cities in America. If Mike Kaufman is indeed Aurora's next mayor, his vote of confidence equals not quite 36% of Aurora voters. Nearly two thirds did not vote for him. But there's no runoff election in Aurora like there is in Denver, which is why Kaufman and Omar Montgomery spent the last week contacting voters on this list, people whose vote had not yet counted because of a signature or an ID issue. I thought it was a scam. I thought somebody was trying to do some fishy business or something. Jeff Marley, was on that list. He went to a ballot box on election day and thought he had voted, but there was an issue with his signature, which is why his doorbell rang on Sunday. Hi, Jeffrey. My name is Kathy. I'm with the Omar Montgomery campaign, and there was a problem with your ballot. Are you an Omar um, supporter? Oh, uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The fact that I'm not a supporter and so therefore they don't care what I vote says, uh, you know, that the voting process isn't as um, straightforward as, as we think. The day after this walk away, Marley checked the mail and had a letter from the county about his not yet counted ballot. I could cure my ballot very easily by texting a message, uh, upload a photo ID, do a signature, boom, done. Very straightforward, easy. I love that. What I don't love is I don't like the fact that uh, the county is giving people my address and saying that my vote wasn't counted. That database that's provided by different counties includes names, addresses, party affiliation, and in some cases, phone numbers. And Kyle, I reached out to about four other voters who tell me they had someone come to their door. All they asked was, did you know that your vote hadn't been counted yet? Here's what you need to do. They never asked who that person voted for. And Omar Montgomery's campaign tells me they ran a script by lawyers and that what we saw in that video was someone going off script. Off, off script. Oh, you like Omar? No. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, not not on the script. All right. Marshall Zellinger. Thank you. Former Governor John Hickenlooper Senate campaign says there is now an answer to a lingering question in his ethics investigation. So we told you how the company that's behind Richmond American Homes would not respond to ethics investigators when they asked the company if they had any pending state business when they were flying Hickenlooper around on their private jet for free. Tonight, Hickenlooper's campaign gave journalists a response from the company. It's a single word reply. No. The state's ethics commission has not decided if Hickenlooper broke the law by accepting free travel from various wealthy interests. 
Hickenlooper says that he did follow Colorado's gift rules. All eyes on the Strasburg Fire Department board meeting tonight. And you're thinking, why in the world do I care about the Strasburg Fire Board? Well, here's the deal. At their last public meeting, that board banned all recordings of its public meetings, and they called 911 on a guy who tried to record. Now the situation has gone to court. Steve Steger looks into a case that could literally change our view of how government operates in Colorado. They've banned video, audio, photography uh, recording at their meetings. Brad Jones is intimately aware of the ban because right after the Strasburg Fire Board passed it, they had one of their members call the cops on Brad. He's up here and he's not taking his camera out of our meeting. Jones and the district go way back. He was a volunteer firefighter and paramedic there, even won an award for it. He started criticizing a conflict of interest, talked with us about it on camera, and got fired by the board at their meeting the next day. Oh, and he's suing the fire board for going into executive session without a vote, violating Colorado's open meetings law. Today, his group added to that lawsuit, alleging the district broke the open meetings law once again with a policy banning cameras because they posted it before they ever talked about it in a public meeting. This policy was printed, laminated, displayed in public hours before the meeting took place. Jones and friends of Strasburg Fire are asking a judge to throw that policy out. Me with a tiny camera sitting quietly in the corner doesn't disrupt the uh, public's business whatsoever. And he believes he has the constitutional protections to keep doing it. I do not intend to follow that policy. And in fact, I'm aware of many other members of the public that do not intend to follow it. And I encourage the media not to follow this policy. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Strasburg Fire did not respond to our questions today, but the board has said in the past that that ban on recording public meetings would be refined. We'll see tonight. Back in March on next, we told you about the start of restoration work on an iconic red barn in Repo County. It's on the 17 Mile House Farm. Photographers love that spot. It's gorgeous, has a vintage look. Restoration work on that barn is now finished and it's back open to visitors. The 17 Mile House Farm dates to the 1870s. It was a rest stop for pioneers in Colorado. The name 17 Mile refers to its distance from downtown Denver, specifically its distance from the intersection of Broadway and Colfax. 73 years ago, Rockley Music started selling instruments and appliances. And they'd fix up TVs and radios as well. At one time, they sold records. Technology changes, times change, and now that business faces its biggest change yet. Here's our Noel Brennan. It's real easy. If you had to put music to this story. I, I think it would have to be something upbeat. And this story deserves music. We have a disclaimer, my degree is in flute performance. It's fitting someone from the Rockley family picks the piece and plays it. Leanne Rockley goes with classical, a nod to nostalgia and the history see. of this family business. This is actually our original location at Colfax and Wadsworth in 1946. This is Melvin Rockley, my husband's grandfather on the right here. Just one of those mom and pop, you know, old time businesses. After three store locations and three See, generations. This is my mother and father-in-law. Rockley Music, the oldest retail shop in Lakewood, can't hold on another year. We are uh, looking to sell our iconic property here on West Colfax. It's a little bit sad in a way. It seems like the end of an era. It's tough for longtime customers. Mm -hmm, for sure. To imagine a showroom cleared out and a recital room empty. Musicians of all ages and all, all instruments have been here for various reasons throughout their time. Business is not ending just evolving and downsizing at a new location. We're going to be focusing on our services, so piano tuning, piano moving, repair of pianos. 73 years closes with one big sale, but the music... Not sad per se, but a little bit nostalgic. Music still plays and stays in the family. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Rockley Music plans to liquidate everything inside by the end of the year. When we return here, we'll bring you a live briefing from Denver police on the potential threat to Islamic centers across the area today, as well as information from the Imam of the mosque that was apparently targeted this afternoon.
Our next question comes from a next viewer named Lana. She noticed one of the orange wind socks along I-70 near the Colorado-Kansas line. They're out there to help drivers gauge when the winds are dangerously strong. And Lana wondered, what's the wind speed necessary to make the socks stand straight out? Lana CDOT says the wind socks along I-70 at the state line need gusts of 25 miles per hour or more to be at full mast. Partial mast means the gusts are somewhere between 5 and 20 miles per hour. If you'd like to ask our next question, send it over to next at inews.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. A calm, quiet weather day with seasonal highs in the mid-50s, and tonight high clouds coming in ahead of a nice warm-up on Friday. Temperatures tomorrow will come close to 70 ahead of this system already bringing the cloud cover to the region. Most of the precip and energy will stay north. The really cold air is just off to the east of us, and with this brief little break in between these storm systems, the ridge will bring in southwest winds, which will allow for temperatures to warm way above average tomorrow. There'll be a fair amount of cloud cover, and with that westerly flow, a bit of a mountain wave shape up along the foothills, so it should make for a pretty sunrise tomorrow and sunset. In spite of the cloud cover, a very nice Friday coming up. Good travel, I-25 and I-70 if you're getting an early jump on the weekend and heading into the high country. 68 tomorrow and mild ahead of a cold front Saturday afternoon that will bring wind and a few snow showers, no accumulation Saturday night. Sunday is mild and dry, a nice warming trend heading into Monday and Tuesday. A storm that looks a bit stronger and perhaps colder with maybe some accumulating snow is the storm that arrives on Thursday. Thursday, Kyle. Kathy, thank you very much. You know, with all the contentious elections going on and our relative lack of participation in our off year contests, it's worth remembering that voting has not always been easy for everyone in America. I mean, right now, certainly a very diverse group of people to, to participate. It took hundreds of years to get here. Voting has changed a lot in our country from its founding to now. I'm Joyce Deloach Brooks, and we're talking about my dad, Albert Deloach. He was born 1909, died 1983, and lived all of his life in Arkansas. He felt that voting was a privilege that we couldn't pass up, no matter what we had to pay. Historically, it's been difficult to vote for various reasons. In the 50s, he'd have to pay poll tax to vote. Poll tax was a dollar. Poll taxes are really one of many different mechanisms that states have used to disenfranchise people of color. He would go in the community to get people to vote, our neighbors and relatives, and they said, but it's a dollar. He said, we can make a dollar. And sometimes he would pay for people to vote. I'd go out with him. It's not just that they had to pay a poll tax, it's that they also had to pass literacy tests. And our cousins in Mississippi had to re recite the constitution of the state in order to vote. There were these roadblocks to keep you from moving forward. And now it's handed to you? Come on, he would say. Just go there and drop that ballot in. Dr. Joyce Deloach Brooks happens to be the mother of Denver's former city council president, Elvis Brooks, who you've seen on this program. The Smithsonian has a new traveling exhibit about the history of voting. American Democracy, a Great Leap of Faith, is coming to History Colorado in Denver in the fall of 2020. Standing by any moment now for a briefing from Denver police about the perceived threat at an Islamic center in the city this afternoon, a incident that has triggered increased security at a number of Islamic centers and mosques throughout the metro area. The last evening prayer just started uh, a few minutes ago. So there are a number of facilities around the area that have additional security tonight because of what happened, we believe just before four o'clock at the Denver Islamic Center at 30th and Downing. Denver police told us that it was the report of a man with a weapon inside that Islamic Center. We had an opportunity just a few minutes ago to speak with the Imam of that mosque and he described what happened. At the beginning he came and fought with the people uh, and then after that he came with a very assault, like very, very scary gun uh, and just like pointing out the gun to the place and the people here. So everyone ran away and the people came inside and, and it was so scary. It's a scary moment. Denver police are getting ready for that press conference. We'll have it for you when we return.
We're able to converge on that area. This is Denver Police Division Chief Ron Thomas talking about the incident at the Islamic time. Center Live. Uh, uh, right now we are continuing our investigation. We're also reaching out to the Muslim community uh, to let them know that we're certainly concerned about this incident and any others that may occur. Uh, setting up extra patrols, uh, not only at this mosque, but others around the city. Is the man in custody right now? He is. Did Do we he know who he is? Uh, he has not been positively identified, um, uh, but he is in custody. Uh, uh, we're still searching for uh, the weapon. Did he actually make it inside? He did not. So he uh, crossed the parking lot. Uh, the facility is locked, and, uh, but, and so the uh, Individuals that are associated with the mosque were standing uh, just outside the front door. No one was injured. In Correct. That, right? Correct. Does um, comments he make provoke your increasing security around other mosques? Or is it well, certainly they were uh, threatening towards uh, towards Muslims, uh, which is concerning to us and certainly concerning to the community. So, uh, out of an abundance of caution, even though we believe that this is a completely isolated incident, we are going to step up uh, additional patrols around this particular mosque and others throughout the city. Is he cooperating at this point? Is he saying anything? So uh, he is not at this time uh, saying anything. Uh, well, he he's he actually uh, appears to be under the influence of some kind of stimulant. So he's not in a position to really make any uh, probative comments at this time. So what are the next steps? To, because it's, it's my understanding that the imam is working with you guys to get surveillance video. I mean, what's the next steps in this investigation? So uh, the next steps are obviously we're going to have to you know, interview him and identify what his intent was. Certainly this is a bias motivated investigation um, because of the comments that were made and certainly the, the community that was targeted. Uh, so that investigation will continue and we will continue to provide outreach to this community and, and provide extra patrols as well so that they are, certain, are safe. Did this man come to the mosque earlier in the day before he came back with a gun? No, we have no information that he was here previously. Um, he, he had been seen in the area, but had not made any threatening comments to uh, toward the mosque or toward anyone else. Has the police department have a history with him? Do you, do you know him, you guys? Uh, he he uh, does appear to be familiar to us, yes. But again, not not has not been positively identified. Would you say long list of criminal history? Or I don't think that'd be fair to say. And what about so it was just one long gun that you guys were. So we have not recovered a weapon. Uh, the weapon has been described as a long, a long rifle uh, of some sort, and we believe that the weapon will be located in the home that uh, that he was contacted at. Uh, so there's a search warrant that is being drafted to recover that weapon. Does he live in the neighborhood here? Uh, we believe he does. Denver police saying that the man involved in an incident at the downtown Denver Islamic Center this afternoon is somebody who was known to them and who had been seen by people in that area around the mosque came by this afternoon, police say, with a rifle and at some point was making incendiary comments towards Muslims. So now there's a hate crime investigation. This man is in custody, as you heard Denver police say. He appears to be under the influence of drugs and at this point is not cooperating in the investigation. No injuries there at that mosque. You heard the imam describe on our air a very scary situation. Security has been increased at Islamic centers across the metro area for evening prayers tonight. We'll be right back.